So ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please come and take your seats. Stop drinking. The purpose of that break was purely to buy books. If you're not buying a book, come back and sit in your, sit in your place. So that's, uh, gosh, I would love to have power. It would have been great to be an autocrat or a dictator or something, or a school principal or something like that. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my happy task to introduce Carl Schmuder, who is going to talk about what Chesterton have created Campion College. Now, Carl and I first met sometime in the late Pleistocene age, <laughs> and uh, we took a common dislike to a certain type of dinosaur, I think, and um, as a result, we became dinosaurs ourselves uh, <laughs> over the years. But um, it's a real honour and a privilege to introduce Carl. Um, I, as I say, known Carl forever. I mean, for so long that I cannot possibly remember how I first met Carl or what the circumstances were or anything like that. I do remember being friends with Carl and also with James Power Sr. about 100 years ago. And they were talking about this idea they had for a liberal arts college. Uh, and I thought it was a wonderful idea. And I thought we would have wonderful conversations about it. And I thought it may well yield some terrific results, like a conference or something, you know? And, uh, and then at some point, they actually wanted to turn it into a physical reality. I thought, gee, I don't know about that, fellas. It's uh, a bit like being in a minerals boom, you know? It's a terrible mistake for a mining stock to actually try to drill into the earth and get a mineral out. Better, better for it to be all blue sky speculation, you know? But part of Carl's genius over the years has been that he can take these tremendously transcendent ideas and inject them into the physical universe and make them a reality. Now, it's certainly an organisational gift, but it is also an intellectual gift. So Carl, uh, Carl, I think, you know, he may never speak to me again after I say this, but I think Carl is really a natural journalist because he's much more concerned with the specific than the general. So he's a great academic thinker, he's written biographies of Christopher Dawson and Chesterton and all kinds of people. We've all benefited from Carl's writings over the years, fabulous reviews, but he has a, a wonderful way of marrying the eternal with the temporal. And um, I can't remember who it was that said that Christian journalism is all about finding an excuse, a, a current affairs excuse to write about the eternal and um, to write about the eternal truths. And Carl's whole life, in a sense, has been about giving life and incarnation to eternal truths. I cannot imagine a life better spent than producing Campion College. Of course, all of us have to live our private lives well, but I can't imagine a public life better spent than producing Campion College. Carl is also famously easygoing. I don't know how that happens. Uh, it's not. It's not the most known characteristic of Prussians that they're, <laughs> that they're really easygoing. But despite the von Schmuder name, I think Carl is really a spiritual Irishman, really. <laughs> uh, he's, he is, he's so easygoing and so good-natured that he can be exploited by ruthless people. You know, writers who ring him at all hours of the day and night who find that they can't work out something and give him the knotty problem to solve, find that they can't get in contact with somebody. I remember, you know, I, I drew upon Carl so heavily for these books, and in every way, intellectually, organisationally, um, archivally, in every conceivable way. I remember at one point saying, you know, um, I'd love to get some good endorsements for this book. Uh, you know, people like George Weigel and Rob Dreyer and so on. And he said, OK, yeah, I can do that for you. Um, so I know so-and-so who knows George Weigel, and in fact, they put him up in Brisbane, so he owes them a favour. So, uh, and Rod Dreyer, I can find Rod Dreyer's email address. And lo and behold, Weigel and Dreyer and Piers Paul Reed, another great friend of Carl's, are all there on the cover. They don't know how it happened to them, but they're all endorsing, <laughs> they're all endorsing my books. Part of the force of nature and magic uh, that Carl brings. Uh, there is, of course, you know, we journalists have to tell it like it is. I've got to tell you the truth. Carl does suffer one very, very profound 
personality defect, <laughs> and that is an addiction to what are the most excruciating and terrible and tortured puns in the history of the world. <laughs> and I remember, I remember at one great occasion at Campion, Carl was discoursing on why Thomas uh, Aquinas was so fat and uh, how Thomas had been, you know, uh, vexed by this himself and he'd been uh, exercised by it by one of his friends who said, Thomas, you know, look, you're so fat, it's, uh, it's insupportable. And he said, well, always remember, my friend Thomas Aquinas said, one, one swallow does not a summer make. <laughs> <laughs> and when I tell you, that is, that is the consistent quality of Carl's conversation <laughs> over 40 or 50 years. And most of them, of course, I've suppressed. Carl, Carl was a great friend of my father who had this similar terrible personality weakness, you know. There are support groups, really, I think, for, uh, <laughs> for the family and friends of, of convicted punsters. But anyway, I'm going to shut up and get out of the way and present Carl to you. But we are all in Carl's debt for a lifetime of intellectual endeavour and achievement, for a lifetime of practical endeavour and achievement, and for a singular talent for friendship uh, over many, many years. We're in debt to Virginia. We're in debt to Carl, and um, I'd ask you to welcome him as our speaker. Well, if this isn't a case where the introduction is going to be far better than the book, uh, and I don't know what is. Thanks very much, Greg. Well, my question is, would Chesterton have created Campion College, really, as a countercultural institution? And well, in a sense, he did. I'll enlarge in a moment on that ball statement, but first I might mention the prompt for this paper came from a book of essays called If It Had Happened Otherwise. The essays were an exercise in what's called alternate history, in which various authors speculated about the different course of history if events had happened differently. Chesterton himself contributed one of the essays on if Don John of Austria had married Mary Queen of Scots. That is, if the Catholic knight who defeated the Turks at Lepanto had married the English Queen who tried to restore Catholicism in England, what would have been the wider ramifications of that marriage? There were other essays, some slightly amusing. For example, if Napoleon had got away from the Battle of Waterloo that he was about to lose and escaped to America, and, dare I say it, confirming Mr Sheridan's point, in a weak moment I imagined him having arrived on a ship in New York Harbour, going into a New York diner and ordering a T-bone steak and emphasising he wanted the bony part. Oh. So, <laughs> Virginia... <laughs> Virginia warned me not to crack that joke. <laughs> it's a crippling addiction. <laughs> well, these historical fantasies are endless and can become frivolous, of course, but it did set me thinking that an essay in historical conjecture can be an occasion for countercultural thinking because it's premised on the idea that the future is not predestined, that it can turn out differently given a chance event or an unexpected accident. I think this is a salutary challenge to the plea we often hear that we need to think or do something to ensure that we are on the right side of history, as if the future is predetermined. When, as Chesterton thought, if we take two conditions that have come up in different ways today, uh, barbarism is not expelled by civilization. They coexist, Chesterton thought, in every age, just as good and evil do in every heart. And we should avoid romanticising one age and condemning another. Well, in the case of Chesterton and Campion College, his influence on the creation of Australia's first liberal arts college became clearer to me when I began thinking, would he have created it? What was it about Chesterton that might have uh, inspired such a venture? And how might this reveal the ways in which his influence worked many years after his death? 
Now, I knew that the precise concept of a liberal arts college in Australia came to my mind from the English historian Christopher Dawson. But Chesterton was an underlying source of inspiration and a, a reinforcing influence. During my BA degree at Sydney University in the 1960s, my uh, dad, Alf Schmerder, introduced me to Chesterton. He'd first read Chesterton's essays as a student at a secondary school at Assumption College, Kilmore, outside of Melbourne, and later as an early member of, in the 1930s of the, the Catholic lay education group, the Campion Society, after it spread from its foundation in Melbourne to the New South Wales city of Albury, where my dad lived, he became immersed in Chesterton's more directly philosophical and theological works, such as Orthodoxy and the Everlasting Man. Now, like my dad, I was quickly captivated by Chesterton's championing of Christian truth. I found it intellectually compelling and imaginatively exciting. So as the idea of Camping College germinated, Chesterton came to serve a symbolic as well as an intellectual role. He was, in his writings, as I mentioned earlier today, a one-man liberal arts program. And in his person, a practising journalist of profound learning, the embodiment of a liberal arts graduate influencing the broader culture through his writings and his speeches. Soon after Campion opened in 2006, it became, as it's remained, the venue of the annual conferences of the Australian Chesterton Society, uh, of which I became president in 2007, succeeding Tony Evans, the, our founder. And over the last decade and a half, a large special Chesterton collection has been developed, which is uh, in, the, in the new library here, um, as well as I've mentioned. Well, to put the full picture of Campion in perspective, so that the inspirational impact of Chesterton becomes clearer, allow me to dwell for just a few moments on the key ideas of Christopher Dawson. And again, I need to go back to the 1960s. In 1968, soon after I'd finished my Bachelor of Arts degree, Sydney University finally kicked me out, I read Dawson's book, The Crisis of Western Education. I know when I first read that book, uh, as in those days I used to write uh, in the front cover uh, my name and the year of purchase uh, in pen, not pencil. And this was a position, uh, a practice which my later vocation as a librarian rebuked and rejected. But yeah, Dawson, the key idea was he traced the history of the liberal arts as the core of Western education and the channel of Western civilization. He began with the Greek intellectual and literary tradition of Plato and Aristotle and Homer, which was carried to the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire. And he showed how this heritage of intellectual and social order in the Greco-Roman tradition blended with the Jewish and Christian traditions of divine revelation as unfolded in the Old and New Testaments and by the church fathers in the early centuries, St. Basil, St. Augustine, for example, which produced a rich heritage of learning. Dawson then focused on the emergence of universities in the Middle Ages, how they were a new institution in Western culture, an educational institution, and they were designed to deepen intellectually and to spread culturally the understanding of the Christian faith among its leaders and the people at large. And finally, Dawson explored the educational developments of later centuries, shaped as they were by science and technology, of course, the rise of the nation state, and the universal spread of education. Well, I found the book an extraordinarily impressive one, even though it only comprises up 200 pages. But Dawson made clear to me the profound connection between education and culture, and how the survival of any culture including Western culture, was finally dependent on its educational tradition. As he wrote, I quote, a common educational tradition, Dawson said, creates a common world of thought with common moral and intellectual values 
and a common inheritance of knowledge. And these are the conditions which make a culture conscious of its identity and give it a common memory and a common past. Consequently, he said, any break in the continuity of the educational tradition involves a corresponding break in the continuity of the culture. If the break were a complete one, it would be far more revolutionary than any political or economic change, since it would mean, he said, the death of the civilization. And Dawson believed that such an educational rupture had taken place in the West. A vacuum had arisen in universities and in schools from the disappearance of the classics, study of Greco-Roman culture and, and language, signified in the study of Latin, which had vitalised and shaped the Western tradition. And what had replaced this uh, heritage? What was filling the vacuum? He thought there was a twofold change, one related to the preparation for a career, the other to the rise of specialist studies, especially through science and technology. So in teaching, there was a utilitarian emphasis on vocational training, in research as well as in teaching, and ever-growing subject specialisation. And these two influences, he thought, were causing the collapse of a common culture of learning in the West. Now, to note one crucial effect of what Dawson was arguing and how it chimed in with Chesterton was that this uh, loss of unity in learning was causing a wider fragmentation of culture. It was exposing the great mass of people to intellectual confusion, moral uncertainty, and finally, spiritual emptiness. It was emptying out, I think, the soul of the West. What's, what uh, alternatives? Well, he thought science and technology, uh, uh, would, it, would it be uh, a possible replacement, as many have thought over the years? He thought it would not and it could not supply a new source of unity. For science and technology are in themselves morally neutral. They did not provide, he believed, any guiding spiritual or moral principle. For modern society, he said, like all societies, needs some higher spiritual principle of coordination to overcome the conflicts between power and morality, between reason and appetite, between technology and humanity, and between self-interest and the common good. Well, if science and technology couldn't supply any higher principle, uh, what could? and he thought it could be the study of Christian culture. That is, the Christian faith expressed and incarnated in the history of the Christian people. Initially in the West, in the future, and increasingly uh, outside of the West. But this would be at the higher levels of intellectual and artistic creativity, in art, and architecture, and literature, and music, Chart Cathedral, Dante's poetry, Shakespeare's plays, a Beethoven symphony, a Johann Sebastian Bach mass, as well as Christian culture at the popular level in the ordinary life of the people, in family memories, celebrations, social customs, political conventions, and in popular religious culture, in our feasts and our fasts, in retreats and pilgrimages. And in his mind, Western culture was now not only secularised in social terms as a daily experience for people, but it was moving to justify this condition in political and legal terms with the ideology of secularism. This meant religious faith was now becoming privatised, was ceasing to be integrated with the public life of the culture uh, and in these conditions, he thought, only by a steeping in Christian culture, in the spiritual springs of cultural expression, throughout history would Christians be able to maintain a distinctive sense of Christian identity at the popular level. Well, I, I have dwelt, I realise, ladies and gentlemen, at some length on Dawson's arguments because they provide a context for the creation of, of Campion College, explaining the intellectual 
and the historical perspective that lay behind its development. How do they relate to Chesterton? I think he illustrated in his life, as well as in his writings, the living importance of Dawson's scholarly insights. They were a great contrast, the two uh, writers, even in a complementary way. Chesterton was a huge and vibrant presence, physically and intellectually, prominent in public life to the point of being a renowned character, appearing as no more than what he modestly claimed, a practising journalist, writing endless articles to impossible deadlines. We've, of course, heard from Greg in the last hour or more and know exactly that's his life. And yet at the same time, he was a creative artist, producing works of fiction and non-fiction that illuminated the truths and reimagined the realities of life, both human and divine. He was, in fact, an artist in words, I think, who could depict reality in all its richness and evoke a, a vision of transcendental truth and meaning. He provided new perceptions, new imaginings of reality, not in the sense of being an escape into fantasy, but rather as a recovery of vision, which had become dulled by familiarity and fatigue. By comparison, Dawson was a reserved historian who led the secluded life of a painstaking scholar, publishing many books and articles of careful synthesis. He produced drawings of the past, so that for the reader, as the English writer Robert Spate once said, the centuries lie before you like a map. He'd absorbed Sir John Henry Newman's insight into the supreme significance of the incarnation. History, Newman believed, seemed to, seemed to have changed its direction with the coming of Christ. It was no longer running in a conventional line, backwards or forwards. It was now, Newman said, continually verging on eternity continually verging on eternity. And this fundamental realisation shaped his understanding of the past, reaching back to the prehistory of Europe where he looked at the origins of culture in his first book, The Age of the Gods, and then in many other, other books. Chesterton understood that to penetrate the mystery of the incarnation, we have to see and to accept that God dis did not disdain the limits of time and space. That he did not think it unworthy of his divinity to take on, out of love, the limitations of his creation and his creatures. So when it came to the creation of Campion, Dawson's historical unfolding of the Western educational tradition was hugely persuasive. His answer to what threatened it, an integrated study of Christian culture, was immensely appealing. His writings enlightened my mind, but Chesterton enlivened my imagination as his sparkling writings brought this tradition to life. I came to see that it was not just an historical process or a convergence of abstract ideas, but a vital living tradition that found expression in his writings. So each was a decisive intellectual inspiration. Dawson as the first architect, I might say, of the, Dawson, of the Campion program, and Chesterton as the artist who infused it with life and imaginative promise. He was a living model of the Christian culture Dawson recommended studying. He illustrated in a striking way personally what Dawson studied in a systematic way, historically and culturally. Who could resist Chesterton's provocative picture of sanity, for example, in the face of the mounting madness of his age and of ours, when he wrote this paragraph as the conclusion of his 1905 book, Heretics, which proved to be the uh, prelude to his great affirmation of the Christian faith in orthodoxy in 1908. This is what he wrote. Truths, truths turn into dogmas the instant that they are disputed. And the scepticism of our time 
does not really destroy the beliefs. Rather, it creates them, gives them their limits and their plain and defiant shape. We who are Christians never knew the great philosophic common sense which inheres in that mystery until the anti-Christian writers pointed it out to us. The great march of mental destruction will go on. 1905, he said this. Everything will be denied. Everything will become a creed. It is a reasonable position to deny the stones in the street. It will be a religious dogma to assert them. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues and sanities of human life, but something more incredible still, this huge impossible universe which stares us in the face. And finally, he said, we shall be of those who have seen and yet have believed. To give another example of Chesterton's spiritual vision and his capacity for bringing a tradition to life, here's what he wrote about St Peter in his 1929 book of short stories, The Poet and the Lunatics. He said, you remember that St Peter was crucified upside down, as, as you remember, St Peter thought he was unworthy to be crucified in the same way as his saviour. I've often fancied, in <coughs> Chesterton's words, his humility was rewarded by seeing in death the beautiful vision of his boyhood. He also saw the landscape as it really is, with the stars like flowers and the clouds like hills and all men hanging on the mercy of God. So Chesterton's upside down vision proved to be the right way up when it came to viewing God's creation and his ongoing engagement in that creation. It's worth noting that uh, Dawson himself was inspired by Chesterton's visionary genius. It was in fact a Chesterton poem that awakened Dawson's interest in the so-called Dark Ages following the fall of Rome and it led him to write one of his most important books in the early years of his career, The Making of Europe. When Dawson published that book in 1932, he sent a copy to Chesterton and in a covering letter, he mentioned that as an undergraduate, it was his reading of Chesterton's poem, The Ballad of the White Horse, which he said first brought the breath of life to this period for me. The so-called Dark Ages of European history, lasting from the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century until the uh, Renaissance in the 15th, this period had long been denigrated by the dominant Whig historians who interpreted history in terms of inevitable progress towards liberty and enlightenment. So they were dismissive of the preceding period, seeing it in the words of Voltaire as a thousand years of stupidity and barbarism. But Dawson peered more deeply into the Dark Ages and he shone light on that darkness, new light, he saw this period as a time of silent and profound cultural growth, which contained the seeds of so many later developments in philosophy and science, in literature and art and architecture and in social institutions. Now, while uh, I focus this paper is on Chesterton and the creation of Campion, I had occasion to discover recently that he had an earlier impact on Australian higher education in a way that was a certain foreshadowing of the educational ideals of Campion. Last month uh, I uh, was invited to take part in a podcast interview on Chesterton with Georgina Downer, who's the director of the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. You may ask, as I did, to myself, why would the Menzies Institute be interested in Chesterton? It turned out that Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, was a devoted admirer of Chesterton. I found out from Zach Gorman, who's the academic coordinator at the Menzies Institute, that Menzies' private library, now held at the Institute, 
contained various Chesterton and books. Most were kept in his bedroom for easy access and they were annotated or underlined as a sign of cl uh, uh, close reading. When Menzies quoted Chesterton in his speeches, it made clear the deep harmony of thought which they shared. So for this recent uh, interview, I had occasion to think about the intellectual affinities between Chesterton and Menzies. And reading two of Menzies' speeches, one in 1939 and the other uh, mentioned earlier today in 1942, The Forgotten People, I was struck by the unusual blend of perspectives which resonated with Chesterton's ideas or reflected his influence. In the first place, Chesterton's rapport with ordinary people connected with Menzies' sense of their importance and how aware he was that leaders, social or political leaders, often overlook them or dismiss them. Chesterton's off-quoted uh, 1907 poem, The Secret People, found a ready echo, I think, in Menzies' celebrated 1942 speech, The Forgotten People. These are the opening lines of the Chesterton poem that many of you would uh, be familiar with. Smile at us, pay us, pass us, but do not quite forget, for we are the people of England that never have spoken yet. Well, in 1942, Menzies highlighted the middle class in Australian society. Peter spoke about this earlier as the forgotten people. They represent, he said, the backbone of this country. They are, for the most part, unorganised and unselfconscious. They are envied by those whose social benefits are largely obtained by taxing them. They are not rich enough to have individual power. They are taken for granted by each political party in turn. They are not sufficiently organised for what in these days we call pressure politics. And Menzies concluded, the real life of this nation is to be found, he said, in the homes of people who are nameless and unadvertised. So I thought Chesterton's secret people of England had become Menzies' forgotten people of Australia. In the second place, Menzies recognised the countervailing point, and that was the aspirational quality of the middle class, the striving to do better, what he called the noble instinct of giving one's family members a chance in life to make them not leaners, but lifters. The pathway to such opportunity, he thought, was education, and in particular, the university. And as I researched um, Menzies' public statements, I found that the speech he gave in 1939 emphasised the importance of universities for Australia's future and it resonated very clearly with Chesterton's ideas. It was called the place of a university in the modern community. He did not stress, interestingly enough, the utilitarian benefits of a university education, such as its economic importance, or how bigger institutions supposedly make for greater efficiency. He focused rather on higher purposes. <clears throat> he described the institution of the university in exalted terms. He called it a home for pure culture and learning. Learning, he said, even if so-called useless scholarship, is one of those civilised and civilising things which the world needs as never before. Pointing the moral, he said, that the mere mechanics of life can never be the sole vocation of the human spirit. Menzies highly valued the classical education, the classical tradition of education, and the need for scientific and technical studies to be balanced by the liberal arts. A scientist, Menzies told the Australian College of Education in 1961, who was unaware of literature and history or the principles of social responsibility would be dangerous. Well, there are other lectures and features of um, Menzies' 1939 speech that are, are uh, of interest. 
but I wanted to, just to highlight today how much his views on education echo Chesterton's. And he drew on a, a Chesterton essay, um, which was on education, in this 1939 speech, and he quoted it at length. It was not from a well-known Chesterton book, such as Orthodoxy, still less from a book of Chesterton quotations. It came from an essay called On Business Education, which Menzies had found in one of Chesterton's last books of collected essays called All is Grist. And though he was discussing a particular brand of education, kind of education, the area of business, Chesterton had offered a broad statement of principles it clearly appealed to Menzies and may be seen as disquietingly relevant, I think, to our own time, almost a century later. And I'll just quote briefly from it. He says, Chesterton, that the whole point of education is that it should give a man abstract and eternal standards by which he can judge material and fugitive conditions. If the citizen is to be a reformer, he must start with some ideal which he does not obtain merely by gazing reverently at the unreformed institutions. That's what's the matter with business education, that it narrows the mind, whereas the whole object of education is to broaden the mind, and especially, he said, to broaden it so as to enable it to criticise and condemn such narrowness. Now, the cultivation of an educated mind might imply a certain tension, even a contradiction, in Menzies' outlook and, and in Chesterton's, that they valued education for its lifting up of citizens and therefore may have seemed to favour an elite over ordinary people. But the aspirations of Menzies in his speeches and of Chesterton in his writings are of a different kind of elite from our present day experience. The elites of our time in politics, in business, education, the media and so on, tend to be divorced from their roots and disdainful of those less educated or apparently less virtuous. But the elites that Menzies had in mind were captured by Chesterton in another essay where he contrasted what he called poets and prigs. Poets, he said, are those who rise above the people by understanding them. Whereas prigs rise above the people by refusing to understand them, by saying that all their dim, strange preferences are prejudices and superstitions. The poets, these are my words, the poets uplift while the prigs diminish. Chesterton said the prigs make the people feel stupid, while the poets make the people feel wiser than they could have imagined that they were. But this can have strange consequences. Chesterton said the poets who embrace and admire the people are often pelted with stones and crucified. The prigs who despise the people are often loaded with lands and crowned. And he added a sharp reference to the England of his day. He said in the House of Commons, for instance, there are quite a number of prigs, but comparatively few poets. There are no people there at all, he said. <laughs> well, I found it hard on many occasions to resist the fantasy that Chesterton is alive and well and writing as a contrarian commentator in present day Australia. Well, I began by looking at the seminal influence of Chesterton on the creation of Campion and looking back uh, on his impact on Australian education through Menzies. Let me just finish in, in two ways. Firstly, by noting briefly why Chesterton serves as a kind of ideal graduate of Campion College. And secondly, in a final lurch into historical speculation, how he might have organised the teaching of the liberal arts program at Campion and who he might have appointed as lecturers. Well, for several reasons, I think Chesterton is a model of the kind of graduate Campion aspires to produce. Firstly, he had a mind of tremendous depth and delicacy, a profound capacity for reason and discrimination, for intellectual judgment. Secondly, he commanded a prodigious knowledge, a 
across the liberal arts, the key disciplines which still shape and inspire the mind of an educated person. History, philosophy, literature, language, theology, science. And these are the foundational subjects of a liberal arts program and they form the core curriculum at Campion as we've seen at Hartford and other institutions now. Thirdly, he was a superb commentator, communicator, sorry, communicator. He was also a superb commentator. But uh, in writing, of course, but also as a speaker and broadcaster, he did a great deal of that. And finally, he was a man of serious faith and spiritual devotion and moral character. So who would he have appointed to the teaching faculty at Campion? Some years ago, one of our sister um, Catholic liberal arts colleges in America, Thomas Aquinas College in California, ran an enterprising newspaper ad and it highlighted the question, who teaches at Thomas Aquinas College? And underneath it featured pictures of various professors who teach at the college. Plato, Aristotle, Homer, Virgil, Augustine, Aquinas, Dante, Chaucer, Shakespeare. They were shown, I think, in one of the uh, uh, slides that uh, Michael provided. So we get the idea. Who might have appointed to the Campion faculty? Well, I imagine he would have wanted Christopher Dawson teaching history. He might have asked one of his friends, the classic scholar Professor J.S. Fillymore, to lecture in Latin and Greek literature. And another friend, the Dominican priest, Father Vincent McNabb, to teach theology. McNabb was a, a great uh, teak preacher who devoted his life to loving the poor. I've always found it a very touching gesture that at Chesterton's death, he picked up Chesterton's pen that was on his bedside table and kissed it. But probably Chesterton could have avoided making any appointment and simply have done all the lecturing and tutoring himself. <laughs> As he wrote in every genre, he could simply have set all his own books in each of the four core subjects at the college. So in history, we'd have the students studying uh, The Everlasting Man and A Short History of England, literature, the collected poems, various novels, plays, books of literary criticism on Dickens especially, as well as the Father Brown stories. In philosophy, uh, the students would study uh, St Thomas Aquinas and what's wrong with the world. In theology, <coughs> orthodoxy, the Catholic Church in conversion, books of Christian apologetics, such as his uh, collections of essays in books published near the end of his life. Well, the challenge would be, finally, trying to distinguish Chesterton's books so that particular titles would fit it into particular subjects. But immersing oneself in a Chesterton curriculum would provide a liberal education of unrivaled value. Let me finish now with what I've always found is a striking illustration of Chesterton's qualities of spiritual insight and intellectual power. They're displayed in a poem which forms part of a small collection called The Queen of Seven Swords, devoted to Mary, the mother of Jesus, Our Lady, the mother of God. The poem is called A Little Litany, and it depicts Mary and the child. Jesus is crawling up from his mother's lap, and as he reaches his mother's face, he looks into her eyes. Because Mary is untainted, as expressed in the belief in the Immaculate Conception of the one human being who was worthy to give birth to Christ, because of this purity of heart and soul, only Mary's eyes could accept the direct gaze of God. And Chesterton writes, Jesus found his mirror there, the only glass that would not break with that unbearable light till in a corner of the high dark house, God looked on God as ghosts meet in the night. Well, it's an extraordinary image. The child Jesus peers into his mother's eye and finds a mirror of himself. God looked on God through the incarnational purity of his mother. As the Chesterton critic Dale Orquist has said, can we find in all of literature a more profound and provocative image than God looking at God 
in the reflection of his mother's eye. But just to finish, the English novelist Anthony Burgess once said of Chesterton, he was the author of A Clockwork Orange and other books, that he knew what it was like to live on the level of eternity. For many of us, I expect, reading Chesterton has provided glimpses of a life beyond time and space, enduring beyond time and not confined to space. He stands, in fact, as an exemplar of the Campion motto, educating for eternity. And so, to reflect finally on the question, would Chesterton have created Campion College? It's good to be able to answer. His inspiration remains. He didn't have to wait around until the 21st century. Thank you very much. Is, is Greg... Uh, get, get, good, Greg. I'm conscious of uh, the, the time, about over five minutes. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I'll just uh, help Greg to the, to the front gate, as it were. Not to get rid of him, but to bid him a, a sad farewell. But uh, we have at least time for uh, perhaps one question initially, and then I'll come back uh, afterwards. But I don't want to um, interfere with the uh, panel discussion time uh, or the afternoon tea, which we'll have as a break. So if there was any uh, initial question, uh, let me address that and then uh, score to Yes, Edmund. Um, so your corresponding person in the United States is Dale Alquist, and he he started a high school. Why uh, a Chesterton High School? Why the difference here? Yes, I, I suspect it, it uh, touches on the points that uh, Michael Mendieta made earlier, and, and that we're so conscious of with the the development of Campion, and that is how difficult it is for our culture, particularly now, to understand what the liberal arts are. And even though all those schools are named after Chesterton, they don't regrettably only teach Chesterton. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but I think there's a very strong tradition, as is shown in the liberal arts colleges in, the, in the America, uh, that uh, an understanding of going off to college after you've finished school is not only an acceptable option for young people, but it, 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 to such an extent an imperative one. Uh, so I think he could, he could um, even though that tradition I think has declined, it's by no means gone. And I think he's, he was able to, uh, and has been able, these schools continue um, as you know, Edmund, uh, there's about 60 of them currently, and I think there's another 16 that are going to open very shortly in various states of America. So I think he, he was able to, uh, and is able, to um, tap into that. The, the other thing, and again it's related to Campion, uh, is um, things have got bad enough, I think. If you look at the sort of the push-pull factors in movements, the, the, um, the, the pull factor is the attraction, the attraction of a liberal arts education that actually is based on faith and reason. Uh, that's the pull. The, the push is everything else is so bad that we've got to look at alternatives and we've got to put some effort into <coughs> establishing alternatives and providing options rather than just cursing the darkness. Let's light a candle there. So I think those those have made a uh, you know had a tremendous impact in America and enabled Dale to even though I think he is tremendously surprised by how successful uh, they are. Well, I might just uh, take Greg uh, out, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we could let's break for afternoon tea, if you would, and we'll resume in 20 minutes for the final session that David Daintree will uh, chair. Thank you very much.